any fish that's following, do not quit. Learn that from the musky guys. Do not quit. Don't quit. It's saddening to the guy who's been rowing you. At least make an attempt. Because some you're only going to have one that'll ever do that in your entire lifetime. Come across a river for 100 feet, chasing you a 15-pound cromer, slashing at your thing. And don't get all choked up and stop when it's at the oar. That was Russ Mann with a powerful reminder while fishing streamers. Another streamer guru with a fascination for pain. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thank you for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you'd like to request a new guest for the show or would like to hear someone uh, we've had on the past, uh, you can find me at Wet Fly Swing on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, either way, probably check in on the Facebook group there or send me a DM on Insta. That would be that'd be the easiest way. If you want to hear somebody or even a topic, just check back with me there. Russ Madden, a Kelly Gallup prodigy, is here to share some tips and tricks on streamers for salmon and steelhead. We focus a little bit on steelhead today as we talk about the three setups uh, Russ uses. How and when to strip and pause plus a few of his local connections uh, and people that are producing great flies and products. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get started right now. It's time to turn and burn. So, without further ado, here is Russ Madden. How's it going, Russ? How you doing, Dave? Good, good. Thanks for taking the time this morning to put this together. Um, It's funny, these are always, I talk about the journey to get guests on. I think your name came up way back when I had Kelly Gallup on, I think uh, a few years back, and he mentioned you and a few other people as big you know, I think I can't remember if you said big influences or just people that you need to talk to, but uh, I'm I'm glad to have you on here. How how are things going today? Excellent, excellent. It's kind of rainy here in the northern Michigan today, but make some time tying some flies today. Yeah, what, what do you what do you got going there? Are you tying some? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I'm actually am tying. I do have something going. I've been working on a little bit. Actually, most of my season, to be honest. Um, just trying to put a little more effort into uh, some of the dry fly game. You know, make a little conscious effort to uh, pursue it a little more aggressively. Right. Different manner, I guess I'd call it. And is this dry fly for uh, what what species? Trout, mainly trout. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So trout. So this is like a, just typical, your your tines. It's, just... it's like a little streamer guy gone amok and decided he was going to de- devote a season to dry flying. Not dry flies that are standard by any stretch of the imagination, but a little bit greater in size and, you know, aggressive nature of moving them and very similar to like bass fishing. So always looking for new and, and this has been a thing for the past few years for me that I look forward to this time of year. So, but of course thing will take my attention off of it and all of a sudden it'll be 55 degrees near the pier head and the river will start coming up and, I'll think, oh man, the king is the greatest. You know, it'll just something will happen environmentally that'll take me off of the dry and back into something, you know, that I love and enjoy and have pursued for years. <laughs> so, yeah, is is that where you? So pretty much when the the fall, the king salmon is that when that gets you, you know, back? like you know, if you're if anybody's really like you pay attention to you know temperatures around here in the Great Lakes, especially when it comes to patterning some of these fish and where they might be or in the you know vast openness of the Lake Michigan. So if you get certain pier heads, certain temperatures, you know, closer to shore, it'll it'll signify a run. And when those fish come into shore, it's a it's a great way to pursue them when they're in less than thirty feet of water, let's say. So it's kind of diverts my attention. All the effort is focused into the pursuit of the king for about a man, maybe a month here. It's some really aggressive streamer fishing and something that's life changing for a Midwestern or streamer fisherman. You know, when you have the big, you know, when you have the king come right up to the side of the boat and eat a pancarini, you know, it's, it's cool. It's it's 
really, really cool. So that gets you. So basically you have that, that period of about a month there for Chinook. And then when do you, uh, for steelhead, when does that start getting going for you? Um, you know, right after the Chinooks, we'll do the, co- you know, I do a lot of coho stuff and, and there's both some, some lake fishing, some still water, uh, you know, Atlantic environment, port lakes, you know, bays, things like that, that have mass varieties of coho. And I love to see, you know, a hundred dudes casting flies, but I don't, I see nobody casting <laughs> flies, but it, it's a, Cause it's really, really, uh, you know, it's, it's man up stuff. You know, some days you go out there four days straight, get nothing. And then all of a sudden you hit 10, you know, it's one of those deals. So you got to kind of peel yourself off the ground to get up there and do the King thing and the, in the coho thing. Cause it's not going to be the first day or it could be the first day and then never, you know, for here, if you're shore, you know, you're standing on the sandbank or you're wading into the surf. You don't have many opportunities when they're there all the time or when they're receptive to flies or not being run over by charter boats or, you know, bombed at by all sorts of other things. All my attention to that once I get off this dry fly thing. So it's, it's coming. It's two weeks away. Yeah, you're not too far away. And the dry fly, when you first said dry flies, I thought maybe you were talking about tying up some dry flies for steelhead, but that's not quite. The, 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 no, yeah. no. I've, <laughs> I've, I've caught them in the past, you know, especially like, let's say this past, you know, anytime you get a cooling event in the summer, you can have your chance that you're, you know, some skimania in a lot of places, yeah. you know. You know, as soon as you have that cooling river event or, uh, you know, north wind comes through and drops that river temp a few degrees, put some cold rain or whatever in there, those fish will come out of that real estate and get active for that first few days there until 90 degrees come back and they go back into the real estate or put their nose up against the, you know, dam. But there is a, there is a window there. There's another window in the fall, like after the, yes, to, to answer your question, directly after the Kings and Cohos, I move right to the steelhead and then try to get them various ways on the streamer. It gets extremely difficult when you have rivers that have a lot of King or a lot of Coho that are dumping eggs through that time. A lot of egg fluent. It's, it's not really, it's very, very rough on souls to, to do that unless you're swinging like, lasers behind you know bedding fish areas or something you know but you know when you're on the move when you're moving with the fish and and you're not making a hundred sweeps through a run you're making one or two because the boat's constantly moving and that's kind of the way i like to fish all the migratory fish so the bites are absolutely fierce and you're going to take the one with the pointiest hat and that's that's what it takes. So it's a lot of lacerating. It's a lot of lacerating. It's not for the faint of heart, but man, you fall steelhead on the strip is pretty cool business. You might get three in one day, but it's worth it's worth four days. You know, it's worth four days because it is life changing. That, that's what I want to dig into today, you know, focusing on that. I think the salmon is definitely super interesting and I'd love to, maybe at a later point we could dig into that and, and the dry flies too, maybe. But, you know, I think steelhead obviously is a hot topic and maybe we'll kind of mix it in steelhead trouts. They, they are kind of the same species anyways, but, um, but yeah, maybe, maybe that we could start off there just talking. Cause I think the streamers for steelhead is, is kind of interesting. A lot of people will either talk about swinging flies or, you know, that's maybe typical or, or nymphing, right? But you're talking about streamers. Can you describe streamers from, from a moving boat in an animated manner with no anchor? So it's just you you got that big run and you know there's a dozen steelhead in there. You gotta pick that we got you gotta make that right cast. You know, it's gotta be in the right area. You may only get two or three casts there. You're not staying there an hour. So it's it's it's, it makes for some long days because you're not you're not getting those additional casts at fish, but you're pulling them from areas that very few swinging guys get to or understand. Unless you streamer fish a little bit, you're like, oh my gosh, I never knew they were coming from there because it's not the spots where you swing. Very rarely do I get them there. It's crazy, but it's just from constant lacerating of that with a lot of these environments and the nice part is is that there is other fish available in these areas where you can streamer fish for you know steelhead there's also brown trouts cohos kings you know there's a variety of fish during the the time frames that you're talking 
the only tough part is like I said, when everybody, when the egg fluence is heavy and mine as well, just go to a trout river or, you know, just going to be in for it. You're just going to be casting a lot or catching more of the Kings coho's late season because it's, there's not much coolness going on during all that egg for a streamer, dude. It just does not happen. So there's two weeks that are, you know, do something else, go deer hunting and go, go grouse hunting or go trout fishing, you know, where there's no migratory beasts or go to a river that isn't full swing yet. And that's what I've done in my guiding and fishing a lot of times. You know, there's this like unwritten weirdness of for every 50 miles you go down state, it's like a little different in the river systems, right? So if you're up in my area where I have, let's say, just take a migratory river like the Betsy or, you know, the Boardman, both of them have migratory fish. Betsy will go way earlier than the Boardman because Boardman's more hatchery related and has 50% coho or more. The Betsy goes earlier because it's Wild King River. So, you know, the you can shift your gears to other areas to take advantage of later seasons or earlier seasons. And that's something that, you know, streamer fishermen, if you're into the migratory fish, you you got to get onto the water temperature and you got to be, you got to have some buds, you know, live in areas, you know, back before the interwebs, we used to use a thing called phone and like call our buddy who lived on, you know, hundred miles away. And if they liked you enough, they'd, let you in on, yeah, well, yeah, it's just starting. There's not a bed yet. There's some, you know, there's some steels down there. They just moved in. You know, that's because by the time everybody hears about it, it's already too late. You got to go to another spot because the eggs are already pouring. There's a short window when there's actual steelhead with not as many egg as, you know, and that's that's why you can go early in August sometime, you know, later in August and you start finding a few fish that you weren't necessarily thinking were in the river that time of year. The, the browns, the early kings, the, you know, there's more random opportunities sometimes prior to that big waba king. And then just, you know, then you got to kind of wait for it to taper off and then go to those areas that are tapered off or further along, we'll call it. That's the first thing you got to understand is when. You know, or where what's in your area and what's available? Where's the water temperature? Is it a stocked river? Or is it not stocked? Did they plant fall fish there to begin with? Did they plant browns in that river too? So these are all things that are going to give uh, uh, streamer fishermen an advantage because if there's not that many kings, but they planted cohos and browns, then I got a chance at cohos and browns at least. You know, and potentially steelhead. So you can play the game of well, that's going to be later no matter what. So. What I'm saying is you can sometimes get ahead of these runs and do very well. And that's where it's at. It's trying to be ahead of the run and then trying to be, you know, just as it taper when those fish just finally get sick of egg. It's like that last, that next temperature drop down below that 50 mark in the middle of that forties. Then you start, you know, starts waning down every degree drop past that till you get to 38. Then you're, fishing gets a little tougher and then that 34 and then you're like ice on anchor stuff basically i quit when ice gets on the anchor typically on average when is the when is the latest you're fishing <laughs> my rule if you're really going to actually have productive streamer in or swinging for that matter if that nighttime low is below 20 something 21 let's say i usually don't do that great and then it's like one of those where you got to start at like 10 or 11 you have that like noon to one forty five where it's oh you can catch them in almost any run, but then it's dust in the wind, so it's I don't know it's a it, i don't when my guys cast six six times or less and they get ice and have to de ice their rod guides for the streamer with the in lines I'm done not fun anymore at that point. Yeah, this is cool. You're you're painting a really uh, amazing picture because you're not just talking about one species. You're talking about you know salmon and and trout and browns and steelhead. I mean, when you go out there, but do you focus? I mean, when you think about species, for you, it sounds like the chinook is gets you fired up. After There's that, like a yeah. king, it's top of the mountain. It is, and when you're talking streamer fishing in the Michigan in August or early September, chinook is top of the mountain. In landing, pulling power, 
potentially, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, it's something and it's not easy to do on these rivers. I mean, it's not, it is N O T not it's musky style toughness. You know, it's a grind sometimes and uh, shit, the whole batch moved, moved up river on us where, you know, you dig deep and you find that one out of a jam somewhere. And if you're not conviction casting with these Kings, you, it is over. Your lines broke, gone down. It's history. I mean, these rivers are 50, 60 feet wide. You're hooking potentially 30 pound fish five feet away from you on a full out blitz like a pike, except they're pulling like a king. So it is, it is man of war. It is man of war. And if you think that you're going to that reel at all, don't grab that line and break your 10 weight. Break it. Don't give them an inch. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool. It is, it is rugged. And then they'll get and they'll be on the nest and they'll be angry too and that's you know the first ones usually catch are the later ones you know and that's how, how a lot of people get started like wow it's, you know that and later ones are a little more receptive when they're 10 males on one you know pool fighting for position on the next 50 feet up river from a gravel yard you know area so you throw your fly into that kind of mess and usually one will peel off and grab it and that's how what usually gets people's attention versus the standard old nonsense of hoof and puff or, you know, multiple weird methods that people have concocted over the years to acquire salmons on various rigs. At least if you get one to peel out of a group and see it bite off the ore blade, at least you got something done. You know, because short of that in this state is a little weird. So at least that's the way I take it. But you have to be have a trout mentality in a in a salmon loofering world here in, in Michigan. And we don't treat our salmon with that much respect or you know, it sucks to see five roped up on some bumper, or, you know, dragging up a concrete ramp. But you know, that's kind of what it is over here. It's just meat and potatoes. Load that cooler. Oh man, fill that freezer. It's just it's weird and you know, at least at least when I'm seeing that fly and I see that fish bite and that guy put all day into actually getting that, I can give that guy some respect. And, and I don't know if it's an older fish or not, it doesn't matter. That thing came across that river and ate that fly. So, you know, at least that's something. So, and on those Chinook, how many you can keep? Uh, is there a limit of how many you can Pretty, keep? Pretty um, good, good limit here. You're allowed five of them. You know, considering if you're pregnant, you should probably eat one every two or every once a month. And it's probably not. I don't know. I have opinions on that. But the volume of those kings, I mean, you shouldn't be able to take five out of a river or even three for that matter. I mean, they're procreating, but that's a whole nother topic altogether. You know, season, season closures in order to help our stocked fish come back because of our gluttony. You know, it's, it's, you know, minus three fish a day would be pretty nice. You know, two four pounds of kind of a live salmon. Hmm. What are you going to end up doing with that when you get that knife out and you think that's going to be deep red meat and you cut that sucker open and it's a half inch of pelt and then some white stuff. Uh, well, yeah, there's your salmon dollars at work right there. Maybe increasing license fees charging kayaks to float waters you know at least with a stupid sticker for two dollars a year maybe those things could help bring back some resources to our state without billion borrowing trillions but could be wrong yeah that's a that's a whole other <laughs> conversation well i'm curious about the streamer so so, I mean, pretty much when you get going, so in August or whenever those Chinook come in, I mean, once you start with streamers, are you pretty much fishing for, you know, trout, all salmonids? Streamers, yeah, all, for the all wheel, season? whenever that wheel turns one notch, I try to get on the next, you know, the next river or spot. But that early king thing is is really, work. it's going to peel me off this dry fly kick pretty quick. Like, I'm already thinking about it. I'm already getting some 10-weight programs in my mind, and it, you know, all right, you're going to hold on to that with a 10 way glass, but you're going to do it, you know? <laughs> so, you know, making my, making them fish the glass too. I've been doing a lot of that. Some of my guys are older, so now they're doing the glass and it's, it's helped out some hands and some shoulders and some wrists. 
That's right. I I've got an old um I've got an old lamma glass, a graphite that I got when I was a kid. My dad got me, and uh, man, it's it's just noodly and, and old school, but it casts a sinking line really know. nice. Oh, you know what I mean? It's good. It's, yeah, you know, I, I like it. I like doing them. You know, I've been running those badass glass for a few years, and I like those because they're bigger. You know, and I can do stuff with them. Who's that? What's the company there? Echo. Yeah, yeah, it's Echo. Yeah, it's Echo. That's right. I mean, I do all my Scott graphites and the small stuff but not you know those echo badass glass are a different caliber and it gets bigger equipment out there to folks to dabble in it at a reasonable price yeah we might we might dig into a little bit on the gear there i, I want to touch back on the streamer uh, just uh you know you talk about timing and again so you're obviously it's important to know when the fish are coming in. So say you do have some steelhead out there that are, that are coming in. Are you focusing just on those steelhead or is there a potential you're catching, like you said, some Browns, if they're in the system? It's, yeah. That time of year, you know, once you get your first few, cause what also happens is our summer fish that have been in the river, they get a little agitated with the new residents, I guess. So especially like ones that maybe have had their faces up creeks and, you know, buried their face in the turbines kind of thing. And now all of a sudden they got a thousand folks moving in. So those guys tend to drop back at that time of year too. It usually comes with a few degrees of temperature drop out of some random cold front. And then they kind of like they flip positions. Now some of those salmon, once the salmon kick the fish out and, and particular river eye fish, um, the, you know, the Kings get up in there and they kind of run them or back the steelhead out because now it's convenient temperatures for them. Anyway, now they can take up positions and, you know, spots where they can feed up on X. So what the little happen is during that transition that you, you're going to, you can sting a few on the streamer. So those summer runs. And then once you get further down river, you got a chance at some, you know, the early King. So it's, it's really coming to that, but it comes down to that paying attention to what that, River is doing temperature wise, paying attention to some pier heads that you may tend to fish that particular river. Let's say could be the Pier Marquette, it could be the Muskegon, the Manistee, you know, heck, the Boardman, the Platte, the Betsy. You know, they all have that time frame, but if that water doesn't tell you to go there, then certainly don't make the trans, you know, don't go down to there or up to there. How would somebody, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you're a guy, that's a good way to connect with a guy and find out, you know, the timings, but any other tips on how somebody might, if they were kind of new to finding the fish, what would you recommend? There's, you know, tremendous amounts of sonar power things right now available for people, including the interweb, which you can simply dial up some various satellite and acquire the information that's needed. Um, to tell you if, you know, like coastwatch.com, a Michigan state website, that's a good one. Uh, you know, some of the NOAA stuff, they'll tell you temperatures out there. Some of them even give you buoy temps. Some give you ports, you know, but sometimes it's a day off or a day later or a day, you know, it, it's, it's harder with some of those sources get better and better, but that's a good one to start. A couple of good ones to start with. Just simple lake temperature you guys are trying to go catch one off a pier on a fly well don't go there when it's 75 degree you know temp wait till some crazy thunderstorm comes through which is what usually does it and it's basically the wind direction blowing the warm crap out of to outer space and sucking the cold water in so that's when you want that like the thunderstorm is like the rain brought fish in Correct. It did. It probably increased the river volume, but it also brought the warm water away. You know, so it's not only does it have the current, it has the eastern, you know, in some places, whatever direction river you're moving, you know, on the west side of our state, it's, you know, those east winds are important. So those north to east, the shifts like that push that warm water out. And that's what will draw those fish in. And, and those Coast Watch website or, you know, various other ones. Noah's got some better ones, but they'll tell you, you you can pinpoint that with certain electronics too. You can pinpoint it. If you're in a boat, you know where the cold water is. They know where the scum lines are. They have probes that can tell you. All these things can be found out when every when every charter boat in the fleet is within a quarter mile from shore. Guy better get on the bike. There it's probably too late, you know. Because they're moving, they're moving there with that temperature. 
And that's, 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 you know, when you're talking migratory fish in, in a, a lake environment, like here, a manufactured lake, like basically all these steelhead and every fish in here is either a lake salmon or a lake trout, you know, in reality, there's no ocean here, but they come in and the Great Lakes are treated like an ocean via temperatures, usually time of year and the sun and all and the moons, you know, I would predict that our first good few kings are going to show up during this next full moon. It's like a new moon, then the something like that but i bet the next full is like oh man they're coming <laughs> yeah that's it so we're right in we're, we're like august 8th right now so so you're talking within the next week or so it's in the next long. the next full moon is gonna probably trigger a run of king in this in this fine state of ours here to some degree that's it so you're that's pretty funny so you're yeah you're tying those dry flies right now but you're real your mind's on on this oh, i know weeks away from putting this you know putting kicking this to the curve you know the next but it, it's been a great see and i learned a lot so i can't you know i came up with a pretty good pattern this year for the drive but it's it's done you know it's so i missed it you know i haven't i haven't been able to go to other places because of the whole covid thing and circumstances and so i've been just doing that here and it's actually been okay and i, I learned a ton and been very happy with some of the fish I've caught on. So, um, That's cool. Mixing up a little bit. You mentioned the moving boat. So talk about that a little bit. Are you uh, described? I mean, it sounds like you're in the boat. Are you also fishing off the bank for these? No, we're I'm basically fish out of a vessel to cover the real estate needed. You know, when you're talking, maybe you might get a bite in a day. You know, that's the kind of level of toughness that, that you're talking here for fall steelhead, right? You might get two follows and, and it might change your life. You might never want to swing a fly again because that thing came to the side of the boat and followed a figure eight. You know, now that's impact. That changes somebody. When you're seeing 15 pounds of silver, you're, I mean, it doesn't matter if it come from a lake or, you know, whatever. That's real deal. And a lot of times you're why you're two-handed burning the fly. And are you in the lake, are you in the lake and the, and the bigger rivers doing this? Where I would concentrate my efforts, like if it's me and all my guide buddies or whoever, I don't do the captaining thing. I have to go further upriver. Um, but like on my own time, oh gosh, yeah. I, I like fishing those 20 feet of water out there in those bays. But the river is the most fun. Because, you know, once you're out there in a lentic environment, you're just kind of casting out there wildly all over the freaking place. It's 30 feet of water, you know. You know, once they get into the shallows, then you could at least, you know, you could see the weight come in sometimes at the next tier in. So what I consider like the earliest part is go out with like my buddies who do the jigging and do all that stuff. And then con them into letting me throw a fly for an hour or two while they're throwing spoons or whatever. And then at least, you know, they're in that 30 foot range. Then the next tier, when they get into that 12, 15, that's when the guys in personal crafts can, can beat up pretty good um and once they're in the river you know that then it's on they're on the beach literally they, they can be on the beach i've seen fish wash up behind you so you can access all these you know some of these areas from shore some of them from you know obviously rivers or you can wade you can do any of that from any of the port towns any of the pier heads any of you know those guys will be where the fish are they will be where the fish are and those charter boats tell you first that's where you're going to learn the most. Learn those charter, learn that lake, learn that lake. You want to know when those fish are coming, go meet with a few of those guys, you know, and they'll help you out. You'll go clean a couple fish for them, you know, on the weekend or whatever. They'll tell you exactly where the f- are because they know you're f- no pressure to them. You're nothing to those guys, you know, go help them out. Buy them a beer or something. They're probably off at your favorite charter captain's boat, you know, they'd appreciate it, but they'll t- you know, they'll tell you that they, you're no pressure to them. You're just flinging a fly out there. What, what are they doing? What are they chugging? They're chucking just bait. Oh, they'll, they'll be trolling spoons, paddles, you know, all the, the gear people use out in the great for, lakes. Uh, you know? For salmon and steelhead or just salmon? For, for salmon and steelhead. And they'll change the game a little bit and run some high stuff. But that's, that's a whole, you know, whole world of type of fishing. How many people out there, Russ, is, um, when you compare it, I'm just curious, like fly fishermen versus uh, the, the gear fishermen, is it, is it like kind of an even mix or not even? Goodness gracious, no. I mean, if I ripped it up into the, to my state, I don't know if there's, 
you know, you get, if you take hundred day, or I don't know what's a lot of fishing, you know, every place, you know, you categorize that as a difference, right? So if, if you fish two days a month, is that a lot, you know, or, or do you fish, you know, what is the fish really? How many people go out and do this stuff? How many people are doing out there regularly or even have a hundred hours of doing Kings just with streamers? You know, how many guys are going to go back after that first day of zero for zero and, you know, 10 hours lacerating, peel themselves off the floor, go back out there, go zero for zero, 10 hours of lacerating. The next day, go five. I got five. You know, that that's what it's like. Is trout, if you, you know, we're talking salmon, steelhead, maybe. I mean, when you think about, I mean, you know, rainbows or browns, is it, is it uh, more activity? You know, it is, but it's a streamer. It's if you commit to a streamer, very few realize how much work streamer fishing really is until you have a few days that suck. And those days can come when it's raining and those days can come when it's sunny and those days can come on a full moon or a new moon or whatever. It's just suck. And once that you've got to grind through that suck and it's just not easy for most folk. It's, and that's why, you know, some of the other maniacal streamer people that I know, like, you know, one of my good buddies, Lafkus up here, Alex, you know, I mean, if you, if you're dedicated to a certain thing, let's say you're going to troll for musky and you're, you're going to go and there's guys that'll go a few times and be like, yeah, I trolled for musky before. And then there's that 47 days straight. Didn't catch one. Who's going to go 48? That's streamer mentality. That's a guy like Lafkus. That's a guy like me who's nobody's afraid of not catching. It's you're going to be first. You're going to be let, you know, I often think about why aren't guys just running bass poppers for two weeks on the White River? Just bass poppers. Pop, 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 pop. Somebody's got one. What's going to do? Not catch one? Who cares? You know, that's that, that's what you got to have to do stuff that is things like salmon things like steelhead to like really make that commitment because that's what streamer fishing is so you could take a trout guy who's used to grinding you know you could take that trout guy and you could make him a steelhead guy or a salmon guy because he likes the method spots of the fish are relevant he's a streamer dude you're gonna love all of it you're gonna want to catch that pike in four feet of water you're gonna want to catch that bass you know you're gonna want to catch that salmon and that steelhead whatever opportunity is available for you because it's the method you know it's that moving boat it's going and bringing the hottest one with the pointiest hat from 50 feet to your fly and eating at the oil how do you do that take us there to that mo so so you're out there you've got some fish (laughs) describe the cast the 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 retrieve all that stuff if it's say we're talking steelhead well let's say Doing like a typical day, you know, because I like burning flies. And if I get a, a customer, angler, or friend, or anybody, I'm going to choose to burn flies for kings when that water's in that, you know, range because they they overtake flies so fast. So I'm going to burn flies whenever I can because the the bites are absolutely amazing. So usually I would have my guy get used to the cast. And, and when we're talking cast on these rivers, these are my, anytime you're talking migratory river, you're talking 10 to 20% more out of your customer. So like if I were taking somebody on the lower Manistee versus the upper Manistee, my guy can go 35 feet on the upper Manistee. He can be great at 35 feet. Now, some of those guys are laser beam accurate, 35, 40 feet. Now I got the big man of steel when you got a king who's going to move 30 feet in a pump of a tail. That, that guy's moving. By the time the fish commits to the fly, he's got one strip and the fish is already there. That's how fast. Now you're doing every, everything's faster, right? So the distance has to go from 35 to 65. And I have to get, you have to get your guys to go that 65. And anytime you're talking bigger rivers, you just need more out of your customer. And that's tough on a guy. These guys, some of these guys are nine to five. Yeah. You know, they, they just work for, they're not like, yeah, you know, 65 is a long they like doing it for some. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, it's big casts and all day. So I try to make it as easy as I can. Like the perimeter that you're fishing with salmon is like, a thousand times greater than you're fishing for like bass, bass 30 foot, right? 
trout, maybe 20 foot, you know, I mean, you see, you see what I'm saying? Damn it. They're so fast. They're swimming five miles an hour. You know, they're, you're trolling lures at, you know, almost four miles an hour at times, three miles an hour. And think about an average, you're going to strip your fly in. You think that's doing anything? No. Stripping your fly in. You think that's fast? Cast that lure out there and reel it in. Tell me how fast your fly moved. Didn't move at all. Fly barely moved at all. So no matter how fast I have to move my fly, it's not fast enough. I'm telling you, it's not fast enough. It's not real enough. It's not fast enough. Is that specific for, uh, for salmon versus steelhead versus trout? Yeah. I mean, you can move that by as fast as you want for migrants. Those brown trout always eat on a stall. <laughs> you know, it just seems like it. You know, steelhead will fly right up through the water column and go right back down in the same spot like they were eating a dry fly piece of popcorn. Take out a five-inch streamer. You know, salmon will totally, your fly will totally disappear with the force of the fish coming forward, and you won't get them because you're not fast enough. It's 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 tricky. How do you get it? How do you speed up as fast as possible on, on the, you know, when you're on the retrieve? Get a light fly that casts really well. And I've tied a few of them over the years. And the one that I still run a lot is that flash monkey because it is a burn. It's a fly for burning uh, or for pulling that fly fast with two hands. Use two hands stripped like a barracuda, right? And that's actually, that retrieve has helped a lot of people catch tarpon and a lot of people catch saltwater fish that would never get them. A lot of people night fish better with two hands. So if you guys are missing some fish at night, you know, do the slow crawl with two hands. Great way to get started doing that retrieve. Huge fan of the two-hand retrieve, period. I love doing it. I can't as much anymore because of my thumb. I have to pull it out when I need it, usually like couple times a year over those big grass flats and on the white river. That's when I need that. Cause I do this thing and they come piling out, but that's like once a couple times a year. I like that. And, and uh, if I got, I guide a lot more for the salmon than I do fish for, for them. So I would do it every day on the salmon to Andrew trees and probably you'll head to if it were my, because the two Andrew tree doesn't necessarily mean steady. It means burn that thing through the flat area and then kill it during, in the spot, right? They're killing that thing right in the spot. And then you're pl- piling it up again, piling it up again. Because you could start and stop that retreat. When you get good at it, you can do any varieties of pauses, twitches, movements with a two-hand retrieve. And, and it's faster than the other retrieves. So I huge fan of that for migratory fish, especially, but on big rivers, anytime you want to cover real estate, you know, when a bass guy goes through a, to a lake to try to get some fish off of a five foot area, that's, you know, a hundred foot wide, he's not vertical jigging, you know, he's pitching that blade, you know, he's pitching that spinner bait as far as he can. And he's just covering that real estate because you're not pulling them from where everybody else is pulling them. You're just not doing that with the streamer. You might catch them on the opposite side that everybody's fishing. Yeah, that might be one log in, in, out of a thousand kings that you just saw swim by. Yeah, one log's got one sitting there, and that's all you need to make the day. That's it's get out of those pools. Get out of the pools, man. If you want to catch on the strip, get away from that shit. Get away from the chaos. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high-quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. For Ethan, the founder of Stonefly Nets, fly fishing has always had a traditional feel going back to fishing the three-weight bamboo rod with his great-grandmother. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. 
And now back to the show. So you got um, salmon and steelhead, and you mentioned the uh, brown trout. What other species of trout are you fishing for out there with, with streamers? Well, you know, we do the brown trout's mainly what we target up here. Um, you know, and and that's saying I don't mind going out there with a three pole, you know, glass rod and going to beat up on those, you know, brookies and stuff because it's just back to the roots. Patriot down the middle, Old Man River. I don't mind that stuff either. And I like that small river stuff and, and running bigger flies on the light rods. And I love fishing glass and I love the brook trout just as much as I like pulling them streamers half the time. So that's this time of year. So when is the brown? Is that the same? When, when does that get good? When, when you that's, start- after, that's, you know, ironically that you said that on most of these rivers here, a lot of them are open year round, which is good and bad. Um, so with the increased volumes of boats and stimulus dollars and blah, 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 it's become kind of a, a harder thing to stomach recently, having the, the river open year round. Anybody, and now no matter where you go, you're seeing someone. So it's, you know, those three guys from Illinois that used to take fishing, no, they all got a boat. You know, who's got a boat? No, those two guys, I kind of floated them up here a while ago. Right. Are people guiding? Is it easy to get a guide's license there as well? Oh, no, I mean, it's 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 not easy if you want to do like real, you know, the offshore stuff. Inshore, you know, I, I'm not sure if it'll change or not, but no, not very difficult. I mean, your initial investment being a young guide, there's a lot of things, you know, going against you right now. First off is boat sales and some other things, but I could talk a whole hour on just – what does it take to become a new guide right now? The hurdle guys are going to go through in the future, you know, with the permits and the, this and that, and, and the limitations on that, I, I feel like it's not going in the right direction. I think we got to open up some opportunity for some people to get into this fishing and become a guide. Oh, really? So it's getting harder. Yeah. It's getting harder, not easier. The opportunities are lesser because everybody bought boats and, you know, the, basically it's a permit issue, you know, and federally. Federally, the BL, who's the federal agency that controls it? Forest Service. Yeah, Forest Service, yep. You know, if you're talking that, then if they only gave out a thousand permits and that's all there ever is going to be, how does a guy who's, you know, 18, you know, or 17 with no, how, how is he going to do it? Is he going to sign on with these guys and then kind of basically sign his life away? You know, work for like $200 less. So it's, it's weird. It's tough. It's tough on them. But, you know, at the same rate, I should be like, you know, screw all y'all. I, mean, I don't want anybody else out here, but it's not the case. It's, you know, you look down the road and, and I would see like, if my daughter wanted to be a guy, you'd have to find someone to work under, you know, how does it, where does that put, you know, the, the younger folks, these guys had some of these for 50 years. Yeah. I heard somebody talking about that recently on another part. I think it might've been Montana. I can't remember, but I never thought about it really that much, but yeah, I mean the federal, the BLM, the forest service, all the federal agencies pretty much control the guide, uh, the guiding business now in the country for the most part. Right. And our governor shut the motorboat down even. Oh, wow. Here. Yeah. We had, you know, some rough times up here in the Michigan. Why, why was that? I, I that the, the rationale wasn't a hundred percent sure. But they, she did lift it about a half, you know, a few weeks later. But there, there was some COVID. COVID stuff, yeah, yeah, COVID, right, right. May or may not have been. The boating prevention program, and basically the guiding of the entire year was pretty lackluster, considering that at one point we couldn't have people from another house in a boat. Or, oh, right. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it, get, it got down to the nitty-gritty, but everything ironed out more people got vaccinated and whatever left it. so there you go yeah I, i'm curious you know getting back to the uh, the fishing load because it you know somebody's listening to this they're probably you know obviously they probably have some trout experience maybe steelhead not as much probably chinook a lot less but that stripping so it sounds like you just get out there you kind of mix it up a little bit i mean as far as flies Talk about your flies a little bit, whether it's trout or steelhead or salmon. Um, are you always using the biggest stuff you could think of? No, I, I'm actually not. I'm not for a bunch of reasons now. Mainly the first one is everybody else is. So that right there. And what's big? What, what's big for you? 
if it's bigger than seven inches. Yeah, that is big. You know, so you're, you know, seven inch fly is still, it's, you know, if you're thinking about in the terms of a normal, you know, how many seven inch perch do you catch over, you know, 12 inch perch? Well, you catch a ton more seven inches, don't you? Well, seven inch is pretty basic. So when you think about it in terms of prey, predator, prey, seven inch fly to four inch fly is like pretty much where you're going to be. If you actually want to attain something, you could also go giant and just shock them into eating. But that only works once is what I'm saying. You can only shoot that bright arrow over that deer one time, you <laughs> know, you know, that's kind of what it comes down to. So in areas that are pressured or in smaller environments, like we have here um, for our resident trout uh, with no access to Lake Michigan, let's say, I'll just lump it up to that way. Rivers with that's rivers without rivers without access is where your next move after the Kings are. That's where you go next because you can't have the kings or you can't catch fish on streamers when there's a million eggs everywhere. You know, so that it's you know, you got to get out of that environment. Rivers that are open year round uh, that are for trout because at least there you got a chance. You got a chance. And, uh, unfortunately, it puts you kind of directly in the middle of, you know, that post spawn, which is like just it can be rugged. It can be rugged. And then right after then they'll get charged up again. But there's like a time frame where the brown trout aren't super cooperative either. Like I have to be there in order just to get some cooperation at all, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So if you're talking trout with the streamer, most of your in size, if you're staying from five to seven inches, you're covering most of what you want to encounter. And, and my feeling big is seven, eight, nine. That means like you go out there, if it's the first day and you're in, you know, the, place that just opened up for the year and no one's been there and you're the first guy through oh you'll get them you'll get them on that big big stuff the next guy probably not so much yeah smaller so that's that is smaller and smaller and what is the smallest streamer you're using i'm running one inch one and a half inch stuff like not necessarily regularly but like depending upon conditions i'll very rarely in about 60 miles, I'll say, of river, will I go above five inches? You know, probably 60 to 70 miles of where I fish, I won't go above five inches. So that's, you know, a lot of my season uh, because the further down I go, and, you know, some rivers have a tendency, the one that I fished, the Manistee mostly, it gets really ugly after the melt off for a bit. So I don't, you know, March is okay, but April, part of May, you're kind of shut down till it clears. So I have to stay in certain areas. So basically, I fish small flies, you know, in my state because the environment's small. You know, small, relatively small, I guess, would be five, three to five inches. You know, that that's like what I fish, seven weight stuff. C- give us some names if we're thinking about flies. I run like, um, let's say, a one-two circus peanut or a two, four circus peanut most, like those are my two most. Um, I'll run, you know, probably a number four flash monkey a lot of times. Um, like the micro shank saying, you know, the longer of the two. So it's probably about a three and a half inch flash monkeys really good for general use. The four inch stuff I'll use on the migratory rivers a lot. Um, for steelhead in order to actually get the steelhead to totally commit, I found that the fly cannot be giant. Brown trout will eat a giant fly. If that's what you want to try to go for, you could run, you know, antifreeze, you know, a seven inch long antifreeze all day long and never take that thing off for all I'm concerned. You'll roll up steelhead on it. You, you'll get brown trout. You'll get brown trout. But steel, brown, steelhead don't like it. They'll chase it. They won't eat it. They like that five inch. They really do. That's a good tip. So you kind of separate your fishing, like you said, you got kind of my or at least lake a connection to the lake versus the streams that don't have a connection. Yeah, yeah. that's that. I look at it the most. Um, my river basically has the lake part and has a mid range impoundment area, and then it has you know there's two impoundments back to back on it, Tippy and Hoden Pile. But I don't go down to there. I'll fish in between them occasionally, um, but. My my fishing is from above Hoden Pile 
all the way up to the headwaters. Gotcha. And and in there you're hitting, I mean, the Browns or well, yeah. Yeah. The, you go, the more Browns you'll get and more trout you'll get, but the less size, you know, less size, you know, condition of the river, you know, that you can choose your option really. Um, Further down you go, the tougher the work. It's bigger water, trout, twice the volume of river with half the trout. You know, and then, and then you're talking in where how many big trout are in there. Okay, well, you know, there's maybe a few big ones per mile, right? So where are they going to sit? That's that's the tough part too. The lower down you go, the more reward, but the more work. Pretty pretty much sums it up. You can get down to a certain part where there's a lot of bass. You know, a lot of times we'll get steelhead, a brown trout, and a bass. Or a pike and a chinook, you know, I mean, get like some random fish on those lower ends of those rivers. You know, it's fun too because it keeps you on your toes. It sucks when you're losing your king flies through a gator, but you know it happens because you know thirty pound carbon only works so far. Yep, gotcha. Okay, and um, just let's touch on gear just just briefly if we're talking about brown trout. I'm just curious. So you're up there, maybe? Yeah. What do you what are you using there? I use like the most for about 60 miles of my river with, let's say it's 50 days plus a year, 50 days plus a year. I don't need much sinking line. I have found that uh, I've run in this. Basically, here's what I'm exactly running. Scientific angler, Titan tip type three for 50 miles of my river. And that would be in a seven weight on a Scott two piece. Eight ten seven. That's what I'm running for miles of river. I mean, fifty miles of what I run with the streamer. That's what I'm running. The next one, I'm running a nine foot rod with a two hundred grain, and then a six weight with a one fifty. But most of the fishing, because it's been a low water year too, so you got to have a few of them in your arsenal. Is not one line that'll that's a hundred percent guaranteed. So the biggest thing that I would give anybody going streamer fishing is don't plan on what's, you know, one type of line that's just going to work from your hometown. Um, so what happens is, is here, we just had a thunderstorm last night. Maybe I need a type six today. You know, maybe I need an intermediate two days ago of water. So being diverse in your line selection also is, is very, very critical. Small river stuff, all that type threes from SA, bigger rivers, the cold 25s, um, the, the I series, the Titan lines with the I three fives, I five seven, you know, those are good lines for big tail waters. Bigger the river you got, it's gonna hold your fly down at a longer distance because we already know that we go from 35 feet to 65 to 75 to as far as you can cast. I mean, if you're with Afghis, you better get that arm. You're gonna get some Bengay. You know, you're gonna be manning up with that. It doesn't mean he doesn't care if you're using a weight fiberglass rod. You're in the middle of that river on that way. Further away you have, the less they can see that boat. Further you can cast, the better off you are in any fishing you can possibly do. And I can't emphasize that enough. But to think that one line works is kind of you know wrong is basically where I was going with that. But for what I use, I use that type three because it's mid environments, 40 foot cast and about a, a lot of river miles. Below that, then I got to up the game a little bit. And I might use a type six a little bit. Pocket water rivers like the Pier Marquette are totally different than the Manistee. You're going to need different stuff there. So, you know, that's what you got to keep in mind too. Find one of the local guys down there or I'll help anybody with any SA stuff, any SA question, you know, streamer stuff because I've used all of it and I've used it all with fiberglass, with regular stuff, with Billy Bob never cast before in his life, you know, hitting the water on both ends, doing the whole, you know, all of it. What's the tip there? What's it? What you got? What you got to do? The Billy Bob or whoever's brand new, and he's trying to cast a five-inch fly. What are you in a marching band? <laughs> That's what I would actually say to the guy. But besides, after that, I would say you got to shorten your stroke up, man. Yeah, I shorten the stroke. <laughs> you know? yeah. But yeah, so th that's you know, I'll help anybody who has a question on SA lines. I'll help them. Okay. You know, or, or questions that I know because I've run that literally them all even stuff that's not out there right now. So my recommendation is for a mid-sized river, you know, if your kid, let's say it's over 60 feet wide, 
you know, that the types are good and the cold 25 can't go wrong. Yeah. And I'll put a link to your Instagram. And also, if anybody's listening now, they want to connect with me, I'll, I'll, I can direct some questions your way as well. Because I, yeah, I think there's a lot of questions. Lions, obviously, there's definitely lots of questions always on that. Because sometimes you need three rigs. Yeah. You know, and, and there's no better way, no better examples than those big tailwaters in that mid-south. I, call, I don't even know what, like the Tennessee, the Arkansas, the Missouri. You know, those areas have big tailwaters and they fluctuate, not fluctuate like four inches, like six feet. Wow. So if you're on to some of these areas where it's fluctuating six to 10 feet in a day, you, you can't have one line or one rig. You might need a 350 grain and a nine weight to throw a seven to nine inch long chicken in Arkansas. And you might need an eight weight and a, you know, I-3-5 with a small white fly on. You know, it just, you got to have versatility and, and it goes for action of flies too. You know, you got to, if you're just used to running one, I'd advise that you find another one to run. If you're used to running hair flies, high ride action stuff, pick up some lead and learn how to fish it because you're going to double what you're catching. When that water temperature gets cold, you got to run different stuff. You can't always bank on the same thing year round unless that temperature doesn't do nothing. How close are you getting down? How deep are you getting to some of these fish? Um, I'm always seeing the bites, even when I have lead on for the most part, unless it's a low light and the cast is a million miles away. Because uh, usually, you know, I go to the jig fly when the temperature of the river gets below, you know, 40 something degrees, you know. Yeah, I don't like when it gets below 40, to be honest. When it goes below 40, then I'm running lead. I think I'm catching more fish on lead. It's stalled down. It's a different approach. It's a jig motion. You know, a lot of times I'm running that classic peanut. And, you know, waiting systems on flies is another thing. If anybody's tying flies out there, help them without, you know, help them with hooks, anything They have any questions, feel free. I use A-Rex hooks all the time. Um, it's, it's just as important, like, where your placement of the hook versus lead versus, you know, that's part of it, too, is – Thinking about your fly now, I might want a chain fly when it's above, you know, your waiting system with just the peanut alone. You can do three, four, five different types of waiting or unweighting. You know, that that comes down to, you know, a big thing, too. Of, are you too deep? Are you fishing too slow? Are the fish running up to it and not really committing? You know, beef it up a little bit. You know, get, get less down. You know, Playing around with the weighting system of flies is something that's that's very important. And hook, and and the hooks too. Yeah, where would you go? So we're not going to have time to dig into all the fly design and stuff. But if somebody was listening now, do you have some video? Where would you direct somebody to kind of learn a little bit about what you're talking about here? I mean, anybody who's you know any of Blaine stuff, any of you know Schultz Outfitters, is good. They're good friends of mine down down south there and do a lot. Stuff, but they've covered some stuff that I, I've done in the past. Mangled Fly, Johnny Ray, Eddie McCoy, super good dudes. Got some good fishing, you know, fish with them for years, actually. They had a uh, Mangled Fly has a little video out on the peanut. Uh, you know, everything evolved so quickly in this fly tying deal here that even, you know, the evolution of flies and materials that we have now. Um, some of these are just platform go get them flies. And that's what I like to tie because I rather would catch the fish. I'm practical. I don't think it's a matter of the arts and crafts as much as it is that thing. When you tie that fly in that morning, every thread wrap counts. And all you're thinking about is I'm going to get that song, you know, I'm going to get them because that's the fisherman tire versus the fly tire. Fly tire can sit there and do four dozen flies and, you know, probably never use one and ship them all off to somebody else. Me, I'm like, hey, 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 no way. I'm giving you that thing. The fly that works the best is the one I tied this, that morning. That's what it is. That's what's going on my guy's rod. Here you go, dude. That, that's neat because I was out the night before, and I think I needed a little bit more tan in that thing. Or I needed that thing to float a little different. That's why that fly is going to work for you today, because I learned from yesterday. Now, if you take 10 days into it and say, oh, now I got it. So it does. there is that involved, too. 
Yeah, time. I'll oh, just note uh, Mike Schultz, what we had him on just recently, episode 229. We talked about smallmouth bass, which was a great episode. Uh, but there's some similarities, right? Similarities between what we're talking about here? Absolutely. I mean, you got to really like all my big dry fly stuff is bass fishing. That's what I've been doing the past, you know, three weeks. Fishing dry flies for trout. Doesn't matter that I, they were trout. Just fishing them like bass. Tried some new things. Um, but yeah, the, a lot of, a lot of fishing, a lot of the streamer stuff, a lot of the intermediate kind of where it just hovers there. Cause that early spring, they're not moving too quick. So even if the water's way up, you might want an intermediate from time to time. You know, and that's, that's what I learned fishing bass with Schultz. Yeah. Don't, you don't always have to go deep. No, you can, or, or the pace, the pace of that intermediate fishes some flies better than others. Period. Right. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. So if you if you have confidence in or a retrieve that you are noticing things are eating, like for instance, when a few years ago, Mike and I fished a, a river early in the year and I noticed the bass were doing the same thing as those trout. So I took that rigging that I had with bass fishing with Mikey and put it over into the, the trout world. So I could use that next December when the same exact thing was happening. So that's, that's how, you know, that's how a lot of that works too. So a lot of these guys, you know, they'll come up with some different form of a fly, the, the platform fly that I tied. That's what it's all about, providing an effective platform guys to build off of and the of evolution of materials, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, you can find some of my flies, the mangle fly and the Schultz and Northern Angler had a few good ones too. Uh, my local shop up here in the Traverse City give brian and the guys a plug they're pretty good dudes too yeah what, what, which fly shop is that the northern angler oh yeah northern angler yeah so we, they've done a few tapings of my stuff in the past and i usually do stuff fairly they do a pretty slick job at making it pretty simple gotcha most of my flies are guide flies so they're all fairly simple or utilize yep. you know means of construction is what i like to say a lot means of production and construction of the fly is repetitive this quick. How long does it take you to tie your average guide fly? Oh, I got about two of them done since I've been napping at you, but we got, you know, if I'm just relaxing, probably 15 minutes because I'm going to, I know I'm going to use it. It's, it's going for strict purpose. So I put the hours in, you know, I've got to make sure that when I'm tying that thing on at two in the morning, that that one little piece of deer hair isn't clogging the eyelid, you know, <laughs> no, I'm going to use it. Right. So, so yeah, so about 15 minutes away, I'd say. I'm curious, uh, before we take it out of here, uh, Russ, uh, you know, Kelly Galf, we had him on, uh, actually he's been on a couple of times, but you know, he's a big streamer name along with you and, you know, some other people we talked about. Where, where did you, what's the Kelly? Does that go way back today? Cause I know he was Kelly like, has been a long time. Like I always say, he's like, oh man, he's, he's, he's like my adopted dad up here. I learned a lot from Kelly and you'll find very few guys that, you know, some of the, you hear a lot about some folks and, and a lot of it's nonsense here and there. But, but the reality of the gallop is that man fished and, and like, I could go to other places, you know, in my area here of Traverse city, when I first moved up here after saying, Oh, I'm done guiding, you know, and then two ninety nine or whenever it was. I have quick guide and I'm never doing that again. And then I go to all these shops to find out what's going on in the river. And only one shop got it right. One shop got it right because that shop owner fished. And not only did he get it right, he got it right every day. Because I fished a lot. You know, I was 20 something years old, fished all, you know, that's how you meet a guy who fishes. Well, I started seeing that, seeing that truck of his out there every day. That's the difference. You know, that kind of tie on the water versus, you know, it, he fished. So everything he tied, everything he did was with, that's what it was about. Catch sucker. I'm doing better than the next guy. You know, that, that, that's why Kelly and I, you know, gravitate toward each other. And that's what you're talking about, too. I mean, you've been describing that all day. You know, it's not, there's no substitute for time on the water, even daily as things change. I mean, you can read all you want about it. You can think you're the most fancy crap. I just bought this brand new vessel. I'm going to go out there and tear that world up. And what you realize is, first off, it's a little bit harder to row than you thought. It's going to take a little more time to learn this to rowing aspect. 
That's right. The, the struggle sticks, right? Get on them struggle sticks. Yeah. Here you go, buddy. Look, I bought a drift boat. Ping pong and all over, but that's okay. You know, you got to do it. It's just what they realize is it's just a lot more work than than uh, what it actually, you know, what they want to put in. You know, it may have been better just to hire the guide and, you know, you got that part figured out. And, you, you know, one of my customers always says, Kelly, Kelly's customer too. Well, we both have them fishing. What are you using? A guide. A guide. That's what he's using. I always thought that was really great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It'll save you some some pain, right? Save, some, you some some mental, save you some mental pain there. Yeah, for but sure. Yeah, uh, Kelly and I go way back. He's definitely, you know, a great mentor and a pretty good dude. He moved out to Montana a while back, right? And you were, so were you in, uh, well, I guess was that, I'm not sure on the timing on that. I worked for Kelly for five, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere between five and seven years up there before he sold the shop to, to myself. And before we we dissipated it because they were preparing up a new up a new store there a new front yeah yeah I go we go way back and and it's it, it was always he always learned something from Kelly because he was actually there doing it you know he really was there so Kelly left uh, kept let left the Midwest what's kept you there why why haven't you left to Montana or somewhere else I like the ice fishing here to be honest. And my daughters, you know, obviously too. Um, but I, I do like the ice fish. I ice fish many, many days a season. I try to do as much as I can with my girlfriend Brooke, and it's kind of a fun time to get out there. And so this is after the after the steelhead dies down and things start getting cold. When seven cast rule comes in, and then there's this torturing amount of waiting before the safe ice, you know, and I. Then I like to get down down south to visit some some great people down there on the White River in Arkansas, you know, Dallies and Chads, and you know, they're just some good some good folks down there. Of course, I go down and visit with Alex down there too, and he's down there to keep keep them sane. So nice, <laughs> nice, nice, Russ. Well, this has been fun. We've kind of been we bounced around, and I I think. Um, you know, the, the point is on the streamers is that it sounds like you just got to get out there, put your time in and, and have a variety of lines and flies and weight. And there's no one answer, right, on this thing? There's no one answer. But the one thing I will say is you're not going to outrun a king or a steelhead. So you can pull that fly a little faster. Yeah. And it, descri- describe that real quick. just as we get our, So the two hand, how fast? D- describe that. Talk about how you do that. So you're tucking your fly rod in and just. Get the rods underneath your shoulder and your hand over hand pulling your line in as you're casting it out. It's kind of like if you ever see like, a, let's say Timmy Ray Jeff was out there putting in some long line and he's across the pond and he's trying to bring it back in real quick. Yeah, that's it. So you're bringing it in as fast as you can with increment, incrementally pausing it to allow fish to grab. But it's a very, very swift presentation. That's right. And how often are you incrementally pausing it? I would say that in your kill areas, which is, you know, past your current scene, or in your current scene, stop for a second or two, and then you can read the rest of the contour depending upon how far you off from how far you are off from shore. But it's all based on river contour. So you're reading the contour while employing that method. It's not just about pulling the fly in as fast as you can because that would just be stupid. So what you got to do is plan the cast, the current, make sure allow for depth. You know. Sometimes if they might want it just out of sight. Sometimes they'll eat it right up on top. Sometimes they'll eat it on impact. So, you know, whatever you do, when you're doing that fast stuff, just you can play with that current because it's not always the fast retrieve. You can do a slow retrieve with two hands. Like I said, it helps tarpon anglers and night anglers and tarpon anglers because they're automatically strip setting when they get bit. And it feels like it's almost more natural than just the single strip, strip, right? Or, well, I mean, some places require that, like in cold taps. That's what I'm saying about being vers- versatile with these stripping presentations and all that. And weighted flies, unweighted flies, based that on river temp and activity of the fish. Another thing to help, you know, learn the biomass too. The biomass of the river, each one's different. You pay attention to that stuff. It doesn't matter. It's not just the dry fly dudes. that You got to know what there's crayfish in your river. 
You know, you got to know what's going on. And if they're more susceptible during a time of year, like when they're molting or when the lampreys are spawning or when the leeches are more active, learn that cast and learn the biomass and be versatile. That's, that's my, you know, don't get wrapped up into one five. You need a bunch. You want to give us one little, before we get out of here, one little casting tip. Well, you, I, maybe you mentioned it, the, the, the stroke. Is that the biggest part, like when you're casting big, bigger flies? The big thing is remember the line off that water. You're going to do more with the, There's more weight. There's more. Just stop the rod short when you let that line straighten out. I mean, I fished the glass and my hand's dead. It's done from doing this stuff. There's only so many more cortisone shots I can put in there. And my biggest advice that I can tell you is don't panic and don't rush and don't fight for inches off the bank. Just get the fly there. It's fishing 30 feet. The fish knows it's there. And granted, the next guy who gets it three feet closer is actually going to catch the fish. But you know, don't fight for inches. Don't try to do that same spot again. Regroup, get the next one down. You know, things come fast. Are you with the brown trout? Is it typically a, you know, around wood structures? Is that a lot of times what you're looking at? Or is not all current it seems? just depends on the river. The bigger the river, the more sometimes they'll be 30 feet off the cover river trough by a, like a line, you know, lime, limestone ridge or a boulder or a log in the middle of the river in outer space. A lot of times they are in the middle of stuff. The bigger the river, they can wander. So all our river is like we got up here. I mean, this is nothing. This is pickle barrel stuff. You know, you get, if they're not in that spot, they're there. And if you didn't cast there the one day you made your three chances in the hole, the next day you cast off to the other side. You know, it's pretty easy to like pattern fish in a small environment. You know, fly the bigger flies over and over again too. Another good tip, downsize your stuff. It's just too much big stuff going through these things. Some of the swinging dudes are running seven inch flies, you know? Yeah. It's, I mean, very few, like I, the majority of them are about like the swing flies, like four inches, three and a half, you know I mean? That, that's what the steelheads are eating. That's why the, the big, big stuff is ever, they don't like it as much. So you're not ever, you're not ever swinging flies. No, I'm only getting one cast in those rounds. It sucks. There you go. It sucks. But I, I'm only getting one or two casts in some of those spots. It's brutal mentally. And why is that? Why only one or two casts? Because that's you know that that's your only shot. And then if I got a 50 yard nugget where I know I can sit there and drop on anchor and float that you know sinking line through there with that you know whatever banded or you know any of those swing flies, put it through there and or a laser. I like using lasers back when I used to swing a lot. And then I can sit there, I can make 30 casts in that nugget. You know, when I'm in a boat, I'm going there, I'm making one cast at the top, one cast in the middle, one cast at the bottom, and then now ah, you're out of that area. You know, it's 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 tricky. It's tricky. It's harder. But it, it's it's more rewarding because the visuals are, you know, because you're not talking about a two you know, you're not talking about a small fish in a small river where you can out muscle them necessarily. You're talking about you got 30 pound line on and you're thinking that it's not enough. You know, that's that's the difference. You mentioned the figure eight at the start. Was that focused more on uh, like Chinook or are you doing that for other species? Any fish that's following, do not quit. Yeah. Learn that from the musky guys. Do not quit. Don't quit. It's saddening to the guy who's been rowing you. Yeah. good All the way up to the boat. At least make an attempt. Because some. You're only going to have one that'll ever do that in your entire lifetime. Come across a river for 100 feet, chasing your 15-pound cromer, slashing at your thing. And don't get all choked up and stop when it's at the oar. Don't freeze. Yeah, and the figure eight is just a just what it sounds like. You're doing a little figure eight right, right in, by the boat. Even if it's a circle. I actually found that a circle can actually get them to go. If you start coming back toward the fish, you know. They don't like it, but I just do a circle. I tried. I've, I've hooked them right there. They're hard to, but they'll bite it. Just don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Nice. Fish. Nothing dies. You know, I would, what would you say? You don't miss your face with a cheeseburger, and nothing's going to die in front of a raging trout. You're only going to move faster. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's a good, don't quit. That's a good way to sum this up. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I forget, too. What? 
What about what about the next uh, say six months to a year? Anything new coming out for you? you want to give a shout out to uh, with your business or personally? No, I just got out of there. If anybody wants to get a hold of me and can actually take the beating, it, yeah. uh, you can hit me up on on the Instagram. Okay. What do you tell your What do you tell your client? They come in when you're setting their expectations. What, what What's the thing you tell them? So it, you're, well, what I can promise you is a sandwich. There you go. A good sandwich. A good sandwich, and not even that anymore because that's too creepy with COVID. But yeah, all right, just come with some desire, and I got you. And if you got that desire, I'll work as hard as I can for you. But it, some of this stuff is hard. It is hard business, and you got to go in with fire in your eyes, and I'll keep you there. You know, but it, it takes a commitment of some of this stuff. You're the, I mean, it sounds like you're probably the small minority. We mentioned at the start with the dry fly, we have some people out here that are fishing, you know, in the wintertime just with dry flies for steelhead. You know, that's all they do. Do you feel like you're, Man and is, is it just you, uh, is it just you and a few people doing the streamer thing for, for steelhead? A lot of them don't like the king thing. You know, I like the king thing. I think anything that swims is going to need to be caught on a fly pole. And what a better way to do it than on a streamer, because I'm going to the fish's mouth open. And that's all that matters. And and I, it doesn't matter how many hours goes into catching your muskie or catching your king or whatever it is. It's that. You know, that's that's when that buck stands there broadside. Then you might have to work. You might have to sit in that woods all season for that buck to stand sideways. So this is nothing new to people with the right mindset. It's it's the mindset is what it's all about. It's mental attitude. You want to something that hasn't been done go out there and throw a bass popper out there in the surf for months at a time you know i mean you might catch this king you know just picture that yeah I'm, I'm just gonna fish kings with whopper plopper you know, for a year it's gonna cast top water bait you know that's that's the kind of commitment that you need yeah just like like you're saying like musky this is kind of a musky similar it's, it's, musky and you know if i get five in the season that my guys hold on to in a yep. foot river and I didn't lose 10 fly lines and break five rods. Right. You know, yeah. good season. Good. Season. That's rough losing a fly line. Oh, well, I mean, you gotta, I mean, you're gonna have to pick it out. It's going to be all shredded up. They're, they're, thir- you know, and they're, they're stout fish. Most people handle the stoutness when it actually goes down. They think they're like, go to the reel. They need the reels going to help them. The reel doesn't help you when you get bit three feet away and you got 40 foot of line to manage at your foot. Nope. With the brakes on them. <laughs> nice, Russ. Well, th- th- this has been fun. I appreciate your time here. All like we said, Instagram. We'll put a link out there and connect with you. And yeah, man. I uh, definitely. Uh, I'll keep in touch with you. And uh, thanks again. Anytime. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links, everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash two five three, two hundred fifty three. We are highlighting a few lodges this year and uh, love to hear from you. If you have a lodge, if you're working for a lodge, if you own a lodge, uh, either way, reach out to me if you would like to uh, connect with our program we have going to help promote and uh, and book trips and uh, and guests at your lodge. Uh, you can connect with me uh, anytime, Dave at Wet Fly Swing, and uh, just let me know you heard uh, this on the podcast. Just a quick heads up, next week uh, we've got Jeff uh, Lisgay is here. Uh, Jeff, another uh, great uh, lakes uh, master, uh, digs into some on history, some on his background, and just another another huge figure out in the world of fly fishing. So excited to share that with you. Tuesday morning, click that subscribe button so you get updated when that episode is live Tuesday morning. That's pretty much it. That's all I have for you today. That is a wrap. Thank you for hanging in till the very end here. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.